All right, we're going live. We're going live. We're going live. Hey there, students. Tom Ritchie here uh, with Marco Learning for one uh, last little A push review session. So we are getting that uh, getting that started. And good to see y'all here tonight. And uh, Brady is here. He's asking, what's the DBQ on? You know what? I think that that is a great way to start off. Let me go ahead and note that I am not a big fan of trying to guess what the DBQ is. Now, why not? The DBQ is process oriented. So when we're thinking about your mindset, hey, Elroy, when you're thinking about your mindset going into the DBQ, what we want to consider here is that the DBQ is so, uh, you know, is so process oriented. So you're telling yourself before you go into the exam that I will be able to do well on the DBQ no matter how much or how little I know, because even if you are having to focus on interpreting the documents, that is fine. Because, you know, when you think about the thesis point, there are three points that are document dependent. The contextualization, let's say you knew absolutely nothing about the prompt, but you think, you know what? I know some stuff going on around there. I'm going to try some contextualization just to do it. I'm going to see if it'll stick, okay? So the thing is, too, for those of you that have been studying, you've been paying attention in class, the odds of you knowing absolutely nothing about the DBQ topic are very slim. So I would say here that you want to make sure that you are you know, doing the things that you are supposed to do here. Now, also remember, ladies and gentlemen, there are some things that Marco Learning has on their website. So if we go to marcolearning.com, and I think here that Sophia will probably give us a link to the study guides in the chat, maybe pin that, okay? So, you know, so marcolearning.com, and we'll be able to go to free resources, okay? Just want to make sure that you're getting everything that you can out of uh, this experience here. So remember that Marco Learning is here for you. We've got on the free resources, go to study guides. Okay, you can do that or we can go here. We've got the study guide packs. And so there we go, free study guides. Go to, uh, you know, AP US History, where have we, yeah, AP US History study guide and you get a little one pager for each of the units in the A push course. Okay, so this would be a great thing to download and kind of look at tomorrow, but it's got a one pager for every unit. So I think that that would be a great idea to go over to marcolearning.com and download that. You know, you've got some good things here thinking about, okay, mercantilism, the encomienda system, cash crops, the first great awakening. Um, these are things that you know, we see sinners in the hands of an angry God. Remember that first great awakening with the fire and brimstone preaching. The wrath of God burns against them sinners. Okay, I love how that, okay. So that's the center. But the wrath of God burns against them sinners. That sounds a little more like a second great awakening kind of preaching, huh? Out in the, uh, out in the, you know, frontier. Their damnation don't slumber, all right? The pit is prepared. The fire is made ready. The furnace is now hot ready to receive them in the flames do in the flames do now rage and glow now the fire and brimstone preaching the emotional preaching remember that is common to the first and the second great awakening okay so we want to make a note of that both the first and the second great awakening have this kind of fire and brimstone preaching the emotionalism both great awakenings also result in a decline in traditional um, denominations such as the anglican or episcopal church and the growth of evangelical denominations non-traditional denominations such as Baptist Baptist and Methodist, who make up uh, a lot of American religious people today. So, you know, also remember the Second Great Awakening was a catalyst. It was a causal factor for antebellum reform movements, such as, uh, you know, being, you know, abolitionism and temperance. OK, so as far as that uh, as that goes, that's something that it would be in your best interest to go ahead and take a look at those free study guides. So the antebellum period. Now, Jason, I love hearing someone say something like the antebellum period rather than a numbered period, okay? Because remember, period numbers never appear on the exam. So as far as that, uh, as that goes, that the antebellum period, 1820 to 1860, this is the period before the Civil War, anti 
meaning before anti, and then of course, bellum, which is the war. So this is before the Civil War. Now the antebellum period, that is beginning with, historians put the antebellum period beginning with the Missouri Compromise, okay? And that's because the Missouri Compromise is the first time that there was a debate about the expansion of slavery into the West, okay? So when we're thinking about, uh, you know, before that, when we think about the Northwest ordinance of, uh, you know, the Northwest Ordinance of 17, uh, you know, 1780, yes, 1787. Yeah, that's, you know, I tell you, uh, this, uh, this coffee's got me going, but sometimes I forget the specifics here, okay? But the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 during the Articles of Confederation, that this was something that was, um, you know, when we think about the Northwest Ordinance, that is something that nobody argued about it. It banned slavery in the Northwest Territory. And I've uh, said, so, you know, today we think about the Midwest, Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, Illinois. OK, shout out to those of you, you know, Wisconsin, those of you who live in those states. I hope you all, uh, you know, it rains down fives there in the uh, in the old Northwest. So with that, what we're thinking in terms of here is the Missouri Compromise is the first time that it was controversial. And no Note that it's not an abolition thing or anything like that. It's just a belief that slavery should not spread here. Okay. So, and what happens is Henry Clay makes his first compromise. Okay. Henry Clay makes his first compromise with the Missouri Compromise. And that is, of course, that Missouri will come in as a slave state, but then as a kind of quid pro quo, New England is going to get an additional two senators, because uh, you see that Massachusetts is going to be, Maine is going to be split from Massachusetts and become its own state. So New England gets the, you know, gets two more senators out of it. And remember, part of the Missouri Compromise is also trying to create a situation where this won't be argued about all the time. So they draw the 3630 line in the Louisiana Purchase, okay? So that's something that is important there. So going, um, going there, um, you know, so uh, let's see, uh, in order to, uh, let's see, so let's, uh, wow, talking about John Brown and all of that. Yeah, so um, antebellum, like that includes everything from the Missouri Compromise to the nullification crisis, which of course the nullification crisis was South Carolina's uh, revolt against the tariff of 1828, that tariff of abominations, okay, tariff of abominations, which uh, was the highest protective tariff ever passed in, uh, you know, the history of the United States, the tariff of abominations, 1828. So then there is the issue when you look at manifest destiny, that is another key issue when we're looking at you know, manifest destiny, another key issue when we're looking at the causes of the Civil War, that the United States is moving west. And along with that, the question of should slavery be able to expand into the Western territory? So, of course, abolitionists, they did not want, um, you know, slavery anywhere. They said, let's get rid of slavery everywhere in the country and let's do it now and let's not compensate anyone for their slaves. And so then, you go to the free soilers and the free soilers, they're really like more pragmatic. They're not trying to end slavery in the South, but they say we don't want slavery to expand. OK, we don't want slavery to expand into the West. OK, so people like Abraham Lincoln before the Civil War, free soilers. So the Kansas Nebraska Act, this was now the Compromise of 1850. Now, note with the Compromise of 1850, what we're looking at here is uh, and let me go ahead and just share that uh, with y'all. Compromise of 1850 um, lecture notes. Let me go ahead and put that out there. So we've got some things. Uh, we've got some things here about the Compromise of 1850, and I'm just going to go ahead and share that. Um, that is actually a blog post that I did on my website. Um, so Compromise of 1850 um, a push notes. Okay. So basically when we're looking at the compromise of 1850, we want to think in terms of there's Elroy rock in the chat there. Um, the compromise of 1850 is an outgrowth of the Mexican American war. Okay. So your historical context of the 
Compromise of 1850 is the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo that ended the Mexican-American War. Now, the Wilmot Proviso, this is a specific, uh, an example of specific evidence that we could use when we're talking about free soil. So, for example, with the free soilers, they put out the Wilmot Proviso, which said that there will be no slavery in any territories that are taken from Mexico. And the way that you can remember that is David Wilmot says that there will not, <laughs> knee slapper there, there will not, there will not be slavery in the Mexican session, okay? Now, the Wilmot Proviso never passed Congress. It never became law, but it was something that, you know, the, the, the free soilers are drawing a red line, okay? They are drawing a red line. And so I've got a video on the Compromise of 1850, even got a rap there that y'all can listen to if you're into that sort of thing. Both of those are on YouTube. So the Compromise of 1850, admit California as a free state. Okay, so California applies for admission into the union as a free state. And of course, Southerners find that unacceptable because Southern congressmen, they were um, you know, very intent on the old way. One thing we see with the Compromise of 1850 is we're done with that whole admit a slave state, admit a free state, the balance between slave and free states, okay, that the free soilers say that's over. We don't want any of that. We want a white West. We don't want any slaves, uh, you know, out in the West. So admit California as a free state. And so in return for that, a Stronger Fugitive Slave Act. Now, note here that the Stronger Fugitive Slave Act is the most controversial part of the Compromise of 1850, but it secures enough Southern support for getting California admitted as a free state because states like Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, Maryland, they were having trouble with the Underground Railroad, you know, with their fugitive slaves being, you know, slaves escaping to the North and Northern state governments just kind of turning a blind eye. So the stronger fugitive slave law put the federal government in charge of the enforcement. Now, how are we going to, to decide slavery in New Mexico and Utah? These territories taken from Mexico, then, you know, basically they come up with this idea. Stephen Douglas, who, you know, the Lincoln-Douglas debates and runs for president as a Democrat in 1860, proposed popular sovereignty. Remember, let the settlers decide what's going to happen in the Mexican session and, uh, you know, going from there. Then, Texas. Now, Texas, basically, you know, everything's bigger in Texas, even Texas. All right. So Texas claimed that Santa Fe was theirs, that this is Texas. The United States claimed, no, this is Texas. So how did they solve it? The federal government says, all right, this is the way we solve things. We'll give Texas some money. They give Texas $10 million. Now the whole Dr. Evil, $10 million, okay? And that was a lot of money back then. I know you're thinking, I can make $10 million in like five seconds. But back then it was a lot of money, okay? So just take my word for that. So then abolish the slave trade in Washington, D.C., okay? So that is the Compromise of 1850. And of course, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, this is an attempt to apply popular sovereignty in Kansas and Nebraska, okay? So in Kansas and Nebraska, applying, popular, applying the principle of popular sovereignty. And so from there, you know, applying this principle in Kansas and Nebraska. So going from, uh, going from there, now Kansas and Nebraska were both in the Missouri Compromise, both north of 3630. So according to the Missouri Compromise, that was supposed to be, all right, that the, uh, you know, that it was supposed to be close to slavery. But as we see that the Democratic Party got, you know, got a big return in the 1852 election. They decided, let's push the issue. OK, let's get popular sovereignty there and let the settlers decide, which, of course, ends up with the bleeding Kansas. And so with that, um, we already went over lilac. If you if you go back to the beginning after this is over, we did a we did a little bit with the first and second Great Awakening already. Okay, so as far as that uh, as that goes, uh, let's see. So and I and I'm focusing mostly on, uh, you know, mostly on some things as far as come on now. I hope nobody's getting a one. That would be a waste of time here. So you know, remember, try to make your um, 
your questions, uh, you know, answerable in a forum like this. OK, so who were the know nothings? OK, did they go by a different name? The know nothings on you called themselves the American Party. Know nothings was kind of a nickname because when these people now the know nothings and we can call them that that was what they were generally called, but they called themselves the American Party. OK, and basically this was the know nothings and the Republicans both made an attempt to become the successor party after the collapse of the Whig party. So basically to be the competitor of the Democratic party after the collapse of the Whig party. So as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, that's what we're looking at, uh, what we're looking at there. Um, so great, um, Hardcore Adam, I'm glad you're finding this, uh, finding this helpful. So that's something that, you know, what were we, uh, you know, just a second here, what am I, you know, sorry, I'm just, who I've been going for, you know, a long time here, okay? So, uh, you know, all week for A push and Euro. So that's something that um, were they, um, let's see, what was that? Yeah, y'all just remind me of that. And, uh, you know, let me just kind of figure that out. Um, Woodrow Wilson. Okay, let's get some goats into the chat. <laughs> All right. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and go into Lyndon Johnson and the Great Society. Okay, so Bender Boys Hockey. Shout out to Bender Boys Hockey um, that we're going to go over Lyndon Johnson's Great Society. So let me just run in here and there's something else that I can share here. Um, so the Great Society. OK, so, uh, you know, when we're looking at here, let's see what I've got here that uh, I think I've got some some things about civil rights and Vietnam. OK, so let me go ahead and share um, some notes here. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and share a set of notes. All right. So anyone with a link can view. I need to make sure that's set up. OK, so I'm going to note here. This is some things that I've got about the Great Society and civil rights. OK, in the 1960s. So let's go ahead here. Great Society. Civil rights. And Vietnam. OK, so as far as that goes, there are some things that should be there. I don't know if I, oh, you know what? Um, I think I may have to send those um, to, let's see. So as far as that goes, let's see. Yeah, I'm going to have to uh, send those in the chat to the admin. OK, so we've got that here. And let's go ahead and put that in. Marco Learning is going to have to throw that in here for us. So what I'm going to do here is just kind of make a little run through because somebody's asking about, you know, what about the great Great Society. OK, so as far as that goes, the goals of Lyndon Johnson's Great Society, um, this is, first of all, the war on poverty. Second of all, civil rights legislation. Those are the two planks of the Great Society, which represent the greatest expansion of the, the largest expansion of government since the New Deal. OK, and so as far as that goes, remember the war on poverty. Now, a couple of programs that are specific to the Great Society, Medicare and Medicaid. Now, Medicare is government sponsored health insurance for the elderly. Medicaid is government sponsored health insurance to give access to health care to the poor. OK, so the way I remember this, senior citizens need care. OK, they need care, whereas. Someone who is poor could use some aid. OK, so if you're poor, you need aid. If you are elderly, you need care. And basically, we want to note here that Medicaid's for, for the poor, but Medicare, um, you, you know, there are plenty of people, when we think about Social Security and Medicare, these are things that help middle class people in their retirements, okay? So it's not just about the poor. Now, the Civil Rights Act of, uh, you know, of 1964, it said no discrimination in public accommodations or employment, which of course, you know, represents something of a mindset shift, which before this, the government didn't really involve itself in the private sector. You know, if you own a restaurant or a hotel or something like that, you know, it's your business who you serve, uh, you know, and who you refuse service to, which refusing service to someone is a really stupid way to run your business. And so from a libertarian perspective, 
this is a big, like, you know, a big change in the government's orientation that, you know, if you are open to the public, then you have to serve the public regardless of, you know, their race, their gender, their ethnicity or anything like that. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 also mandates equal opportunity employment. Now, you might be called upon to compare the New Deal and the Great Society. So there are some things there that might be helpful. The Immigration Act of 1965, if we put that in the context of the civil rights movement, that's something that, you know, after 1965, it is the first time where, you know, basically the United States is not preferring, uh, you know, Northern Europeans um, in immigration. So in the 1920s, the first immigration uh, quota acts, they, per, you know, there was a preference for Northern Europeans, Scandinavia, Germany, Britain, um, and so Britain, Ireland. So with that, note that World War II kind of set the stage for the civil rights movement. I'll let y'all look at some of this other stuff here, Plessy v. Ferguson and Brown v. Board. Then looking at, you know, when we're thinking about, uh, you know, as far as, you know, integrationist, OK, so integrationist. And then when we think about, you know, black power, um, you know, black power, black nationalism. OK, so there are two types of, you know, types of branches of the civil rights movement. OK, integrationist. So the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Martin Luther King, the Nation of Islam. That was an organization that Malcolm X was part of. Now, remember, later on, Malcolm X leaves the Nation of Islam to actually become a Muslim. Now that you'll have to look that up why that makes sense. The nation of Islam is not Islam. It is a, uh, you know, it is a, a black supremacist organization that basically combines teaching like things from the Bible, things from the Quran, kind of put some things together. But again, Malcolm X in the mid 1960s, he left the nation of Islam to become a Muslim, make his pilgrimage to Mecca and all of that. And in fact, when he made his pilgrimage to Mecca, Malcolm X, you know, that was where Malcolm X really ceased to be a racist um, because he was surrounded by people of all races and it really changed his perspective. You know, I mean, he sees, you know, white people, you know, from Bosnia and other places, you know, making their pilgrimage to Mecca. Right aside, Af you know, right aside Africans and Middle Easterners and uh, South Asians and, you know, people from Indonesia. And so Malcolm X changes his orientation. But no, he never ceased to be a black nationalist. OK, he was mostly concerned about the black community. One thing we'll note is that the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, they both were very, very receptive to partnerships with sympathetic whites. Whereas, you know, we look at the black power and black nationalist movements, you know, they are more focused kind of in that lineage of Booker T. Washington and Marcus Garvey, whereas, you know, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and SNCC, they are, you know, when we think about the lineage, okay, if we think about the lineage, um, W.E.B. Du Bois, okay, so W.E.B. Du Bois and the NAACP, okay, so then when you look at, oh, whoops, all right. Whoa. I don't know how I did that, but uh, I'll uh, I'll figure that out. Lineage. OK, so you've got here Booker T. Washington um, and Marcus Garvey. OK, so Marcus Garvey, which are more focused on, you know, lifting up, uh, you know, lifting up uh, black people with self-help. OK, so that's what you're looking at there. So, again, these are some things that I think will will help you out there. It's got some court cases and going into de facto and de jure segregation. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, now one thing, uh, you know, a push um, immigration notes. OK, so if we look at a push immigration review notes, you can go to my website here and I've got basically a complete summary of immigrations, immigration and internal migrations from the Bering Land Bridge, 13,000 B, you know, yeah, about 13,000 uh, BC up to contemporary America. And basically it is by period. Now, not by numbered period, but by historical period, the progressive era, about 1890 to 1920. So as far as that goes, ladies and gentlemen, that is there for you. And I want to wish everyone the best of luck. You know, let's go ahead and the immigration review notes. I've just sent those uh, to Marco Learning to post in the chat so I can make sure that we've got uh, we've got that. I'm shared in the chat right before that we cut off. And so with that, <laughs> wow, who let Greg cook? 
All right. So ladies and gentlemen, y'all make sure that y'all are, you know, getting a good night's sleep. That is important. Make sure that you're getting a good night's sleep, that kind of thing. And we want to make sure that that's, uh, that that's going on as well. So with that, Let's go ahead. Raw slate time. All right. So excellent. Excellent. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, um, we will go ahead and yeah. So the immigration notes are in the description of this video. So excellent. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, we at Marco Learning wish you the best of luck. And remember, ladies and gentlemen, that it is always a pleasure.